Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. We're going to continue on here with our neck pain classification system, and we're going to get into class three, which is neck pain with radiculopathy. Now, before we get into what kind of things to look for and what treatments there's evidence for, let's first recall what a radiculopathy even is. So radiculo usually refers to a nerve root. So we're talking about either chemical irritation of a nerve root or some physical structure is impinging or compressing a nerve root. Now, what might those physical structures be? Well, it could be something as simple as a portion of one of the cervical discs. It could be osteophyte formation, which might occur as we age. It could even be ossification of the ligamentum flavum or even inflammation of the ligamentum flavum or facet joint hypertrophy. Basically, anything that potentially could narrow that intervertebral foramen which is where the nerve root exits as it goes out to the upper extremity, right? And so these patients will have neck pain, but certain movements or positions might exacerbate their radicular symptoms. So here's some things to look out for. So common symptoms to put somebody in class three right here would be if they had a herniated disc in the C-spine. Now, there's no physical exam that you can do to test for a herniated disc. Uh, however, you can certainly rule that up with certain presentations, like some of these that we'll actually look at in a minute. Or you might know this from the results of an MRI, let's say. They have a herniated disc, so maybe that rules up them being in this category. They also might have peripheralization and centralization, basically a directional preference. So maybe there's one movement, and by movement we mean things like cervical extension, maybe side bending, rotation of the neck. Some of them peripheralize their symptoms. So they initially start in the neck, but then they actually go out into one of the upper extremities. That would be peripheralization. There might be some movements, maybe flexion of the neck, that centralize the symptoms. And so they take the symptoms from being out in the upper extremity and it, they remove it from the upper extremity and bring it back to just being in the neck. That's a directional preference and that's a sign that somebody does have radicular symptoms. And those radicular symptoms you can further bring out in a neuroscreen. And so you might see abnormalities in the dermatomal and myotomal patterns and also reflex changes. In terms of the dermatomal component, let's say you have a radiculopathy of C6, the C6 nerve root. Well, you would see maybe numbness or paresthesia, so tingling, maybe burning, a shooting pain type of sensation, a sharp shooting pain in the area that's innervated by C6 nerve root. That might include the radial aspect of some of the forearm into the thumb and index finger, right? That might rule off that it's C6. In terms of the myotomal part, radiculopathies present as lower motor neuron conditions. So for myotomes, any part that's affected is going to be weak. Might even be some lower tone slightly. And so the C6 component is going to be elbow flexion and wrist extension. So those movements you probably expect to be weaker Elbow extension, wrist flexion are probably going to be okay. And same thing for movements at the shoulder joint. In terms of reflex changes, we're expecting more hyporeflexia in the C6 distribution. So what's the C6 reflex? That's the brachioradialis reflex. So biceps reflex, C5, triceps reflex, C7, those will probably be fine. C6 will be hyporeflexic, maybe a one plus on the scale, or you may even have to use the gendrosic maneuver to actually elicit the reflex at all. So you're expecting those to be diminished. And that's part of the neuro screen, which we'll get to in that examination in just a second. The person will probably also have pain with cervical rotation that occurs before they get to 60 degrees. Now, in general, most people have more than 60 degrees of cervical rotation. But if you ask the person to go through cervical rotation and they're only able to get to 30 degrees and they start getting that neck pain and even um, peripheralization into the upper extremity, that's a sign that they might have a radiculopathy. And also, uh, generally patients with adverse neurodynamic mobility. So the nerves aren't moving right. That's another reason you might uh, put somebody into this category or class three. 
Now, what kinds of things would you want to do in the examination? Well, probably going to do a neuro screen because in general, when the patient comes, they're probably going to indicate, well, I had some numbness or I have some tingling with certain movements, maybe even some burning, sharp shooting pain. That should put on your radar, I need to do a neuro screen. And so you're probably going to assess dermatomes, myotomes, that's misspelled, my apologies, reflexes. And if somebody actually did have a radiculopathy, I'm going to expect some of these at least to be positive. Therefore, we'd have a positive neuro screen. Now, in terms of special tests, we have this constellation of symptoms. This is called Vayner's cluster. And basically, you have four tests right here, one of which we've already discussed. That's pain with ipsilateral cervical rotation at less than 60 degrees. But basically, if you have a positive finding for all four of these, it significantly increases the likelihood that patient has a cervical radiculopathy up to about 90%, which is pretty good. And those four components here, number one, are, like I said, when they have pain with cervical rotation that occurs before they get to 60 degrees of that rotation. Before we go any further, this ipsilateral term is actually very important for this. Remember that people have two directions of rotation. They can rotate left and they can rotate right. For the sake of this argument, let's say that a patient has a C6 radiculopathy on the right side. Remember, we said that a radiculopathy is when you have something that maybe compresses that nerve root on the right side. So we're talking about the right intervertebral foramen. So what movements of the neck would open the right foramen and what would close it? Because the ones that close it are going to be more likely to produce those radicular symptoms. In general, there's three movements that will close down an intervertebral foramen. Those are neck extension, ipsilateral side bending or lateral flexion, and ipsilateral rotation. So if we're talking about closing down that right intervertebral foramen, it's going to be extension, right side bending, and right rotation. In other words, ipsilateral rotation in, in that example. If we were instead talking about a left radiculopathy, it would be left rotation that would cause those problems. It would be left side bending and then extension. Those three movements are more likely to cause radicular symptoms because they close down that neural foramen and create less space for that nerve root to go through. Okay, So that's why this ipsilateral term is important here. And if they, again, have that pain in the neck at, let's say, 30 or 40 degrees, well before they get to 60, especially if they also have reproduction of radicular symptoms, that is certainly a positive test. But generally, all you're going to need is pain in the neck. It doesn't need to be... Um, in addition to radicular symptoms, although if it does produce radicular symptoms, it just went up on your radar a lot more. The second one in this cluster is the upper limb tension test A, which is uh, an upper limb tension test that has a median nerve bias. Remember that these patients with a radiculopathy may also have adverse neurodynamics. And so this upper limb tension test puts tension on the nerves in the upper extremity, but this particular one, A, biases the median nerve to have a little more tension in that. Okay, And so if they have a positive test for that, it rules up having a radiculopathy. There's also distraction test and Sperling's test. Now, the distraction test is an easing test, meaning you need to be in a position already where the patient has radicular symptoms. Okay, And then all you do is you distract the cervical spine, and it should reduce the radicular symptoms because you're gapping the vertebra and therefore gapping those intervertebral foramina. Okay? So this is an easing test. If that's positive, meaning the patient gets easing of their radicular symptoms, again, also rules up a radiculopathy. And then like the upper limb tension test, which is a provocative test, Sperling's test is also a provocative test. Remember in this one you have the patient in a little bit of extension and side bending, and then you apply an axial load down, which would compress the intervertebral foramen. Now, in a patient with a radiculopathy, note that you're already in a little bit of extension, which closes it down. You're going into side bending on one side, which closes it down. And then you're applying an axial load downward. So if this test is positive, 
That means that the patient had reproduced radicular symptoms, again, further ruling up that the patient has a radiculopathy. And so this little cluster of symptoms right here, Vayner's cluster, is pretty useful for ruling up a radiculopathy associated with neck pain. So if you determine that a patient falls into this classification, class 3, neck pain with radiculopathy, who would benefit most from interventions? Well, there's four things right here that will increase the likelihood that someone will benefit from them. One, if they're younger than 54 years. Okay, this just comes out of a clinical prediction rule. If they're younger than 54 years, they will most likely benefit from Therax and manual therapy and all that. The dominant arm is not affected. So if the patient has right hand dominance, they'll be more likely to benefit if it's the left arm that has the radiculopathy. It's not to say that they won't benefit if their dominant arm is affected. It's just that the data suggests that you're more likely to benefit from this therapy if your non-dominant arm is the one that's affected or the dominant arm is not affected. Okay? Also, looking down doesn't aggravate symptoms. For most people, it's actually going to be looking up, cervical extension. You're less likely to benefit um, if looking down so neck flexion does not aggravate symptoms. In other words, the radicular symptoms and the neck pain. And then any patient is more likely to benefit from this type of therapy if it's multimodal for most of the visits. By multimodal, we mean you're not just doing manual therapy. You're not just doing mechanical traction. You're not just doing therapeutic exercise. You're combining at least two of these things together for the treatment. So it should be multimodal. Now, what are those treatments? Well, here's a list of some of the interventions. Again, not all of them, but these are some that are actually supported in literature. Number one is mechanical traction. This is really beneficial if the patient had a positive distraction test, but in general, it can be beneficial for anyone with uh, cervical radiculopathy. So for cervical mechanical traction, you're really just gapping mechanically all the cervical vertebrae, pulling them apart. And so that creates more space for that nerve root because you're opening more that intervertebral foramen. Okay? Now we talked about cervical mechanical traction in another video, so if you want more detail on this, all the indications, contraindications, precautions, parameters, make sure to check out that video. I'll try to remember to put it in the description of this video, but you can find it on my channel. So do you just want to do mechanical traction by itself? No, you actually want to combine it with therapeutic exercise. This is a graph from a study that evaluated um, exercise by itself versus exercise with different kinds of traction on the cervical spine. And in this figure, the lower the score is, the better, because what they're actually looking at is the neck disability index. And so the higher the score on that, the more disability you have. The lower the score, the healthier and better your neck feels, and the more you're able to do ADLs. So this blue one on the top, this is just therapeutic exercise. You'd think exercise is so great, and it is, right? But by itself, it's not the most effective for a radiculopathy. On the bottom here, the orange one, this is actually exercise plus mechanical traction. And you can see that over the course of a year, so this is actually 12 months right here, uh, these people actually had the greatest reduction in their symptoms and the least disability when exercise was combined with mechanical traction, okay? So you never just wanna do traction by itself or exercise by itself. If you're gonna do these, it has to be multimodal, or it should be multimodal for most of the visits. What exercises might we do? For example, here's cervical retraction. You can do cervical retraction like this in sitting to help strengthen those deep neck flexors. We talked about those in other videos. We'll really hit them in the next video, so make sure to check that out. Over here, B, this is the deep neck flexor strengthening. This is actually the test position for the deep neck flexor endurance test, which is a really valuable test because it's very easy to perform. It can be used as a test of measure. It can be used as an outcome measure, an objective asterisk. It can be used in a goal, right? Uh, but the same position, the exact same thing you do for the test can also be given as a treatment. So it's kind of a progression of this because here you're going, um, you're not going against gravity when you're doing retraction and sitting, now you're actually going against gravity. So it requires a lot stronger deep neck flexors. And so this can be used once the patient has mastered uh, retraction and sitting 
now they're going to use this to further strengthen those deep neck flexors. And that has some evidence that it can help with cervical radiculopathies. And then also lower and middle trapezius strengthening. Now the middle traps are going to be helped with things more like rows. So rows with a TheraBand, you can do rows with a machine. Right here you actually see strengthening of the lower trapezius. To strengthen the lower trapezius, basically you have your arm initially dangling off the side of the table like this. And then you basically just bring the arm up almost to uh, parallel to the table or to the floor, uh, kind of in the upper quadrant. So it's not right off to the side. It's not directly up. It's about 45 degrees from that, between this and this. Okay, so lower and middle trapezius strengthening. Now you can also improve adverse neurodynamics by flossing exercises. These flossing exercises kind of come out of that upper limb tension test. And so if they have initially a lot of issues with that upper limb tension test, then that might be an indication that you want to try flossing. And so there's six sets of flossing exercises right here. So here's the start position, here's the end position. That's one. Here's a second one. Here's a third, and then you have four, five, and six. And so you basically just alternate between those two positions. Now the way you read uh, this figure right here is, as you go to the right, it gets less vigorous. As you go down, it gets less vigorous. So this one actually, um, over here, on the bottom right, is actually the easiest one. This one over here on the top left is the most difficult one. Now to further break down this image, if you look on the left here, notice that the neck movement this patient is doing all on the left here is all side bending, right? On the right side, this is all rotation. Now, if you look at the arm movements, we start here, he's in about 90 degrees abduction, 90 degrees elbow flexion, and then 90 degrees wrist flexion. In addition to the side bending of the neck, he keeps 90 degrees abduction and then extends the arm and extends the wrist. Look at the arm movements over here. They're identical. What's the only difference between this over here and this over here on the same row? These are side bending, these are neck rotation. So at each row here, the arm movements are the same. It's just whether or not you're looking at side bending or rotation. Now in terms of the arm movements, as you go down from row one to row two, notice there's a little bit less shoulder abduction. It's not quite to 90 degrees. As you go to the third row, there's even less shoulder abduction, maybe to 45 degrees. So if you really want to dial back the intensity of the floss, the main thing you're going to change is just the degree of shoulder abduction. As the patient learns to tolerate these, then maybe you can add some more abduction. And so that's the main parameter you're going to change to alter how intense this is. It's just the degree of shoulder abduction. Notice that the elbow flexion and wrist flexion, going to elbow extension and wrist extension, are about the same in all of the pictures. It's just the abduction that changes. You also notice that in terms of less vigorous, rotation is a little bit less vigorous than side bending. Okay. But that's how to read this. Okay. Everything's almost identical, except as you go down, there's a little bit less shoulder abduction. And then the left side of the picture is all side bending, and the right side is all rotation. And you basically just floss back and forth with these. And again, these are going to be more beneficial for a patient that has um, that adverse neurodynamics. Okay. Most likely we will have a really sharp flare when you perform an upper limb tension test like this. Okay, So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how to identify someone who should belong in class 3 neck pain with radiculopathy and how to deal with it. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.